omnipotent, the drugs, <laughs> all those things played a part in his mind. It was totally bizarre, it was insane. Rod's clan arrives in Eustis, Florida, where he has arranged to meet Heather after a 12-month separation. Rod meets Heather over by the cemetery. And there is a cutting ritual that goes on between Rod and Heather. And they decide to meet up later at her house. The plan is, Heather will grab some clothes and run off with Rod and his vampire family. Hi. Hey, uh. Hi, Annie. How you doing? Good. Heather spends a few minutes to watch the TV with her parents. Then she gathers her things and slips out the door. But first, she leaves a little note. Dear Mom, Dad, and Jenny, I don't have much time, but I must say that I love you all very much. I'm leaving for good, but I don't want you to worry about me because I will be fine. Please don't try and find us. Just know that I'll miss you and will always love you. Heather. Rod has arranged to meet Heather quarter of a mile from her house. In her haste, Heather forgets to pack everything she needs for the trip. There was some memento that Heather had left behind she wanted me to look for. The decisions made that, that Rod go back to the house. Okay. I can go back for you. And then Rod says to her, says, you've said to me so many times, you want your parents dead. Do you want me to, you know, kill your parents? She says, no. Don't go anywhere near my parents. Don't touch them. OK. Scott, let's go. Scott and I took off. We tried the garage door. And it was unlocked. So looking through the garage, I chose upon a crowbar. I saw Richard Wendorf asleep on the couch. We traveled in to the back bedrooms as swiftly as we could. They're creeping through the house. He yanks the phone out of the wall so they can't call. We came back out into the living room area proper where Richard was asleep. And the dad turns and sees him. Then they hear that Heather's mother. She comes out of the bedroom, and he just starts beating on her with this tire iron. Rod Farrell and his sidekick Scott have attacked Heather's parents and stolen their car. I wiped the blood from my face, my arms, my chest. I took my clothes off and burnt them. Rod has got his sight set on the Windorf's SUV. It's a newer vehicle. It's a nice vehicle. So they take the SUV, and then they, they go down the road. Ignorant of what has happened, 
Heather and the rest of the vampire clan wait for him. Flash your eye beams. Heather sees her dad's SUV. Her first reaction is, my parents are looking for me. Rod signals for Heather, Charity, and Dana to follow in the other car. Heather realizes Scott and Rod in the car. Then she's saying out loud, she says, well, how did they get the car? How'd they get the car? I don't understand. Wait, how did they get the car? She doesn't understand. The convoy heads out for New Orleans. Meantime, Heather's 17-year-old sister returns home from a night out. Jennifer walks into a brutal murder scene where you see your father bludgeoned about the head. Blood, brain matter. Mom laying dead. None of us, I think, would ever want to walk in and see what she saw. She's on the 911 call. She says, my parents are dead. They're trying to calm her down and stay on the line. An officer's coming your way. And the officer goes in. He's got his handgun out. He's checking the rooms to make sure there's nobody inside. My dad's car is missing. The Eustis Police Department were thinking it must be some kind of home invasion type of robbery. We got two people dead brutally. And my God, you know, where in the world is Heather? While the police question Jennifer for leads, her sister Heather is in a car with Charity and Dana. Following Rod and Scott in her parents' stolen SUV. Heather has no idea her mom and dad lie dead in their living room. A few hours into their journey, Rod decides to break into a house. Rod burglarizes a house and steals a shotgun. And he took Heather aside and explained to her in great detail what had happened, how it all evolved, how he killed her parents. I was like, I, I'm your parent now. Heather was terrified. Rod gets them to swap license plates. They're all going to travel in the stolen SUV. One. So we all traveled together in one pack. Let's go. And we took off for New Orleans. They kept that tire iron in the car under the seat near where she sat. I think it's kind of an intimidation thing. Back at the Wendorf house, the police are putting the pieces together. I want everyone get a lot of Jennifer's telling them a little bit about Rod. Uh, she's got this friend, his name is Rod, and he's into kind of a vampire stuff. And then they're really getting alarmed now. The police now suspect Rod Farrell of the murders based on Jennifer's information. And then they're making calls up to Kentucky to the police up there to find out what they're dealing with. 
And the, one of the police officers up there says, you got a really wild bunch on the loose now. Vampire killers are running wild, and the police have no idea where they are. They put out a bolo, what they call a bolo, it's to be on the lookout for. The FBI was involved. They had police agencies all along the Gulf Coast that were involved. News is breaking of a double murder which took place in the Eustis area last night. Details are sketchy, but we believe the police are seeking a group of teenagers. We will give you more details as soon as we have them. Back in Murray, Kentucky, Rod's mother gets news of the murder of Heather's parents. They said Rod killed two people. It was total shock. There's no really emotions. There's nothing really that you can say as a parent, as a mother, when you hear that kind of news. Folks are worried that the teenagers are driving back to Kentucky to continue their bloodthirsty rampage. I mean, the cops were on high alert, thinking Rod was going to come back and, and go on this mass killing spree. However, the fugitive teens aren't heading north, but west for New Orleans. Rod had that shotgun on his lap and said, if any cops try to arrest us, I'll blast them. He's killed already. He's going to kill some more. After three days on the run, Rod's band of teen vampires are beginning to lose faith in their leader. Rod is struggling in some ways to have them believe, you know, I'm this immortal soul and I, I'm your leader. And, uh, and, and there's kind of a dichotomy in the way that you see the kids react and feel. I think they, that veneer is shot for them. Even to them, he has crossed the line. This isn't romantic. Is it just wrong? and we're scared, and we're hungry, and we're running. The reality didn't live up to the hype. When we reached Baton Rouge, we were virtually on the last legs of the money we had. Charity believed that she could get money on a wire from her mother. Charity calls her mother, who is a corrections officer in South Dakota. Mom says, look, I'll, I'll wire some money to this motel. Well, of course, she tips the police officers off in Baton Rouge. It was uh, November 28th, 1996, when we received information off the double murder. The suspects had apparently been traced to our city so we put the word out to all of our patrol people to, to be on the lookout. Despite his better judgment, Rod agrees to collect the money supposedly wired by Charity's mom. We had to go to some hotel of some sort to pick up the money. And I told her, I said, this is a trap. I was like, once we go there, there will be cops everywhere. No, 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 my, my mom wouldn't do that. I mean, she's already wired us the money, okay? So, we get to the hotel. I looked across behind the hotel, and I thought in that moment, I was like, I could leave right now. I could run. This is the last chance I have to run. If not, I will probably die. We were dealing with violent suspects who had committed a double murder, and so you take every precaution as a law enforcement officer when dealing with those type suspects. Surely enough, as I believed, <laughs> mere moments later, there were numerous 
police all getting out and all drawing their weapons and all telling me to freeze and don't move. Those traveling with me were worried that I would take drastic measures. They saw that I had reached the point of no return. If I die, so be it. All of these people ranked up against me, weapons drawn and ready to use them. They didn't realize how much I just had given up, how much I didn't care. Rod's teenage bravado is short-lived. I thought to myself, I'm a up, mentally deranged teenager who's about to lose his entire life. And the only thing I might be able to do is save these other idiots who have followed me. There was no attempt to run uh, or offer any resistance, and they were taken into custody and detained at that point. 